Hi everybody and welcome to Josiah is Right. So today I'm going to focus on what is arguably the greatest run in comics ever. Specifically, the first 10 issues of the Fantastic Four as found in the Marvel Masterworks Volume 1. Note the cover here. It's a bit more gaudy, but as you'll see here with Volume 2, you have the now more common and much more museum-like or masterworky cover. However, the content is the same regardless of the dust jacket. So I'll be focusing more overall on trends you'll see, standout issues I will point out, both good and bad. For more specific details, be sure to check out the links in my description of my series of retro reviews for the Grand Geek Gathering. There's tons more specific stuff there, so please check those links out. In the 1950s, Marvel wasn't yet Marvel, and they just kind of chased whatever sold funny books. Among them romance, westerns, and monster books. Remember the monster books, because they're going to play a big role in the early issues, these first 10 issues of Fantastic Four. There are various legends about how it actually happened, most famous being the owners of National and Timely, aka Marvel and DC, or DC and Marvel, actually, to get the order right, were on the golf course discussing Justice League. The Justice League had recently reassembled to battle Starro, basically a giant evil starfish, and it sold pretty darn well. Regardless of how it happened, the sales figures didn't lie. Justice League was very popular. Superheroes were back. Martin Goodman, owner of Not Yet Marvel, instructed Stan Lee to do a superhero book. Later in life, Jack Kirby, who at the time didn't get the credit that Stan Lee did, became bitter because he felt he deserved that credit for creating everything. Stan Lee would never say, yes, we created everything together, but he'll sort of sidestep the argument and say, if they say it that way, I'll say I co-created it. My take, they definitely co-created them. It's a 50-50 split. And each without the other, we wouldn't have the modern comic book as we know it. From their friendship, partnership, and later professional and personal tension came the modern comic book. With all that, we start where the Marvel Age of comic books began, Fantastic Four number one. This issue is among the strongest of the first ten because it establishes so much of what would become not just the Fantastic Four, but the Marvel Universe in general. Looking at the cover, you'll see we're in that transition from monster comics to superhero comics. Again, not so unlike Star over Justice League, the Fantastic Four battles a big monster, though we'll learn he's not really the bad guy here. Spoiler alert, he is. Mole Man. The first issue starts with the team already assembled. They already have their powers, and they're actually coming together to fight some super threat as their Fantastic Four flare is shot into the sky. Four flare. We then jump back in time to learn the origin of the team, and then return to the present, which is 1961. So spoiler alert, I guess, if you haven't read it since the 60s. It's a great narrative device that really propels the story forward. In this first issue, we have the first brilliant, tragic Marvel villain, the Mole Man, pushed underground by society, a society that rejected him, and then rejected by the Fantastic Four. Over the first 10 issues, we see a lot of shuffling and shifting, but we get a lot of things that are established, again, the Marvel Universe, but specifically the Fantastic Four, including, but not limited to, a distant but caring leader in Reed. Thing vs. Johnny. Thing being mad at pretty much everything, but loving, kind of. And Sue having hair that shows you exactly what decade this comic book was created in. Issue 2 is significant because it brings us the Skrulls, the first really great villain in the Fantastic Four corner of the Marvel Universe. However, they're not really the terrifying, menacing creatures they'll later become. They're more sneaky, ugly monsters than the scary, powerful creature they'd much later become. The end here, however, is noteworthy, as it is very EC Comics with a Twilight Zone-style twist of the Skrulls being morphed into cows with no memory of who they were. With issue 3, we finally have the best tagline in all of anything anywhere. The greatest comic magazine in the world! It would later become the more flowy and therefore more catchy. The world's greatest comic magazine. Regardless of the exact wording, this is where the awesome hyperbole that is Stan Lee, that hyperbolic language that really defined the nature and the style of the Marvel Universe, just as Kirby's pictures defined its artistic side. Other than that, and with a lame villain, Miracle Man? Doctor Strange much? I'd say skip issue 3. Issue 4 also brings another Fantastic Four and Marvel dynamic that's really key. The bad guy who's not really totally a bad guy. Neymar, the Submariner. From our first meta reference, and Johnny burning off his beard, actually burning it off, to the burgeoning relationship with Sue, this one is a keeper. Other staples introduced here include the Fantastic Car, Thing reverting to human form only to tragically revert back to Thing form, 
and the previously mentioned meta references. Issue 5 brings us Doctor Doom. Doom sends the menfolk back in time, and the thing in a wonderfully tragic, all-time great comic book story becomes Blackbeard, and he wants to stay, but of course he doesn't because he can't. He's the thing, and it can't end well for him. Poor Ben Grimm. The design of the team is also finally firmly, or at least more firmly established here. In the first several issues, and actually even after this, the looks of the characters would shift a little bit in terms of costumes, things like that, especially the look of the thing. Thing started out much more gooey and kind of gross, and slowly becomes the chiseled granite monster we now know and I personally love. In issue 6, we have two villains, count them two. Doom and the Submariner team up. Of course, Doom is a legit bad guy, and Neymar is more wonderfully complex. So Doom betrays him, and Neymar saves the team. I wonder how Sue will react to this. Note the quality of the last several issues here. The FF have been established for what makes them the FF, and Kirby and Lee have really hit their stride. Issue 7 is a bit of a step back, involving aliens and shrinking, and kind of a dark ending. A little bit of EC Comics there. But issue 8 introduced the Puppet Master and his niece Alicia, and a powerful and tragic ending. One other key Fantastic Four trope is introduced, that being... A guilt-ridden Reed trying to cure Ben, feeling responsible for Ben becoming the monster that he now is. Other teams, the Avengers, the Justice League, well not the X-Men, but a lot of these other teams, they're just teams. The Fantastic Four is a family. Issue 9 isn't bad as recent movie mogul Neymar tricks the Fantastic Four into making a movie that turns out to be a hit. And issue 10 goes crazy with the meta as Stan and Jack show up as characters in the comic. The final two issues, while not as good as some of the others, are still really good because Stan and Jack had established what worked and just kind of started to go with that. But again, this is just all establishing what Stan Lee and Jack Kirby would eventually create. The greatest comic book soap opera ever written, ever drawn, ever told. Well, up until just about right now, the Fantastic Four may have been pariahs in the modern Marvel Universe. They are still Marvel's first family, and this is where it all began. I give this volume my highest possible recommendation. It's... It's fantastic. No, 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 not that version! Just read the comic books. And maybe eventually, now with ginormous corporate mergers, we'll get a good movie version? Here's the hoping. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. And be sure to check out my articles on the Grand Geek Gathering. I have the first 10 issues up and plenty more coming. Thank you guys. Hi everybody, I'm Josiah and today we're going to talk about the greatest X-Men story ever, or at least the what I feel is the greatest, and it's also the shortest. Now, there are a lot of really great X-Men stories, but the one that always kind of comes back for me is, like I said, the shortest, and that is X-Men Days of Future Past. So this edition here is the big fat sort of um, treasury edition, you know, those omnibus style books. It's not technically either of those things but it has a lot of extra stuff. So we're gonna look at the original story and look at all that extra stuff to just kinda see how it all comes together in this big book. This collection includes Uncanny X-Men 141 and 142, the original story, annuals for Fantastic Four number 23, New Mutants number six, X-Factor number five, and X-Men number 14, the Days of Future Present story, Excalibur 52, 66, and 67, Wolverine, Days of Future Past 1, 2, and 3, and Hulk, Broken Worlds number 2. The original story starts in 2013 and goes back to 1980. So in 2013, the remaining X-Men are in a prison camp. They include Co Kitty, Colossus, Rachel Summers, Franklin Richards, Wheelchair Magneto, and Storm. They send Kitty Bride's mind backward in time to her younger self via Rachel's powers. They're doing this to stop Mystique and her new Brotherhood of Evil Mutants from killing Senator Robert Kelly. The book is the best of Byrne and Claremont. Uh, their tumultuous relationship working together really created some great stories. And it's their final real story. There is a Kitty Pride Christmas story that came after this, but neither did better work than they did on the X-Men. Though they both had great stories, Claremont's New Mutants, for example, and Byrne's first run on Fantastic Four were really great, they never really matched what they did together. The second issue has the best tagline ever. In this issue, everybody dies. With that, I'm sold. 
The aspect of Kitty Pryde, this adult woman, a woman in her 40s, going back to her own body as a child, as a teenager, is very profound and it deals with issues of aging that I can relate to now more as a woman. At least now as a husband and a father I, and I grow older, those things really have a deeper impact on me and it, and it really makes that short two issues of the story just even more deep and more profound. Now the sequels. This is where things get crazy and unnecessarily so. Rachel Summers, Phoenix, is now a regular part of the X-Men world. Ahab, a very 90s cyborg pirate for some reason, chases her into the past and kidnaps Franklin Richards and Nathan Summers. Yep, Cable is a baby with giant tiny baby guns. So this all took place in annual spanning X-Men, X-Factor, New Mutants, and the Fantastic Four. Things start with the Baxter building reappearing and the current Fantastic Four battles Jack Kirby-styled versions of the Fantastic Four. Future Franklin shows up. He's the one causing all this. Ahab is basically trying to make Rachel one of his hounds, as she was before, which he does do to Cyclops and Sue Storm at one point in the story. Franklin then attacks the New Mutants. X-Factor then comes into things and it turns out Frank is looking for Rachel Summers. Adult Franklin keeps altering things and making people and things disappear kind of randomly. The X-Men show up and it turns out future Franklin is actually dead. There are plenty of other details in there, Forge and Banshee, early Gambit, Thing being awesome, but it's just small moments that get lost in the focus on Rachel and Franklin, who just, you just don't care as much about those two. Though the tragic romance does connect in the final issue. Overall, the art feels very rushed and kind of sloppy. And there's an editorial out front that kind of addresses that, basically saying it was rushed. And there's reasons that Rob Liefeld didn't draw it. And a few different artists, I think, actually came to, at least on the New Mutants book. And, um, or maybe the X Factor, I don't know. But there, other than the X-Men one by Art Adams, which really stands out, the art is really great, detailed, that, that really hyper-detailed 90s style of art. And it just holds up really a lot better than the other books. It's not the best of Louise Simonson, who is really normally great. I love, love, love her work on... Um, X Factor and some other books, but this one, it's just not there. Um, everything in this story just kind of makes it more complicated. Uh, the Fantastic Four being involved and the Franklin Richards thing is fun and sort of fighting the Jack Kirby style characters is fun, but the rest is just kind of land. The one exception is the very end of this book, The Fundamental Things with Wolverine and Jubilee. It is awesome. Written by Chris Claremont and penciled by Mark Heichel, Wolverine is telling Jubilee why the X-Men matter, which is great, because Wolverine cares about something, which is why Wolverine's great, because he pretends not to care, but then he really cares, and that's what's awesome. Franklin shows up, and Wolverine basically solves the whole thing by being gruff and his awesome self. So the Excalibur books, it's issues 52, 66, and 67, with 66 and 67 being sort of another version of Days of Future Past slash Days of Future Present and it has sort of funky names around those ideas and again it's just it's just more of that same and um it's it's okay but it just feels like padding to this edition um fun as individual issues probably at that time but for a collected volume it just doesn't really maintain. We have a story where Professor X is in the mind of Phoenix trying to figure things out it has some good stuff and brings up Rachel's issue with her mother, uh, which is also in the Days of Future Present story, and the nature of the Phoenix Force. Uh, good work by Alan Davis and a great cover. First, there's a ton of text to catch you up. I mean a ton. This is where you see just how insanely complex things have become, and these stories just make them more so. So number 66, Days of Future Yet to Come. Widget is possessed by Future Kitty, so we are referring back to an awesome thing in a less awesome way. So current Excalibur can overthrow the Sentinels. Then in number 66, Days of Future Tense, they team up with Future Excalibur to fight lots of Sentinels. I love Alan Davis and his art, so I enjoyed the first issue, but he didn't do the art on 67, so for that reason, I connect way, way less with that one. It's just really cartoony and not as good. It's more of a straight line in terms of story and not as complex and insane as Days of Future Present, but it's also a lot more silly, so it kind of undermines the original story. It's not bad, but totally, absolutely, 100, 1 million percent not necessary. There is, of course, more Ahab, which made a great toy, and there's that. I don't think he's been around since, but hey, the action figure was awesome. Wolverine Days of Future Past. This is the one if you said, what's the story, little Josiah, 10-year-old Josiah, that 
what would you want to read? It would be where Wolverine was before all this happened. Why was he in Canada? How did Magneto get paralyzed? All those things. And this story tells you all that. But all that hype, all that buildup, it's just kind of meh. Magneto is looking for Wolverine. Magneto and Jubilee convince Wolverine to join them for this special mission. Apparently Jubilation and Logan haven't spoken in a while. Psylocke is now evil and after Logan. So Wolverine gets his mind wiped. They have to go to the White Queen who fixes it. We learn how Magneto gets in that wheelchair. He's essentially taking a bullet for Wolverine, really just overexerting himself. Like me, attempting to do anything athletic, I throw my back out by looking at sport ball. The art is by Joe Bennett, and it isn't bad. It's just not as good as Joe Murata, who was really the big X-Men artist that popularized that manga style of the early 90s. Um, and we really learned a lesson here from the late 90s, right? You can just ask George Lucas. In the late 90s, you don't want a prequel for something from the 70s and 80s. It just doesn't work. The Wolverine Days of Future Past story just kind of doesn't feel connected. It's maybe just an art style thing. Um, it's sort of the the feeling that it's very 90s-ish and less 80s, less John Byrne, Claremont, and more, you know, modern creators. And the 90s stuff is great for the 90s, but it doesn't work when you're sort of trying to mesh it with a world, you know, from almost 20 years earlier at that point, you know, before I was even born. Now the Hulk Broken World story at the end, it is great. It just feels like part of the original world that Claremont and Byrne created. It has this heaviness with a little bit of humor to it um, that maybe you could argue that the original Days of Future Past kind of lacked, at least in the future sequences, it's kind of heavy. Um, but here you really have uh, that feel, the, the feel that they created in the original book and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I just wish it were like longer. Actually, this is what I would want of the Wolverine story to be. This Hulk story, but kind of a Wolverine version. This is without a doubt, other of course than the original Days of Future Past story, the best thing about this book. The art is by Juan Santa Cruz. It feels from another time. It's almost perfect for this story by Jason Henderson. It felt deeply connected to the original, yet could just exist on its own as a good standalone story. In short, Bruce Banner in a prison camp wants to awake the Hulk to bust out, and he does so to awesome effect. If you like all this extra stuff, all this padding, get this edition. One cool thing, the best thing about this actually probably is, if you slide off this dust jacket, what is? This is probably the best thing about this book. The great art atoms here on the back with the, the super detailed, the best of the sort of Days of Future Present is right here. On the other side here, you have the original cover for the Everybody Dies issue. Now, if you want this whole volume with all this extra stuff, go ahead and get it. But I really recommend just finding the individual issues and back issue bins on eBay. You can find them all cheaper and you can find the original collection of Days of Future Past pretty cheap as well. So tell me, what is your favorite X-Men story? What is your favorite time travel story, alternate reality story? Who is your favorite X-Men artist? Writer, who are, and Chris Claremont probably, John Byrne should be, right? There's other great ones though. Who stands out for you? Who do you just really love? Why, what artist or writer made you read the X-Men and what stories, particularly the time travel, the alternate reality stuff, what really grabbed you? Because there's a whole lot of those in the X-Men as, this volume attests to. There's a whole bunch. That's pretty thick right there. If you like this video, please hit the like button. If you really liked it, please leave a comment. And if you loved it, I ask you to subscribe. So remember, Josiah is right, and thanks for hanging out. Hi everybody, and welcome to Josiah is right. So as a kid, I recall reading the story X-Men God Loves, Man Kills. One of the all-time best titles ever, by the way. It was probably the first graphic novel I'd ever read. It was even actually printed as a graphic novel, down to having chapters, although it isn't all that long. About 60-something pages. A few years back, my friend Daniel got me a gift card for a comic book shop called The Secret Headquarters in Echo Park in LA. For those of you not familiar with that part of LA, think a lot of bars and dudes with mustaches. A super hip place. There, I purchased this, a brand new copy of X-Men God Loves, Man Kills. 
It is by my all-time favorite X-Men writer, Chris Claremont. Mr. Claremont weaved the richest fantasy sci-fi soap opera I will likely ever read, and he did so for 17 years. X-Men God Loves Man Kills features characters from those 17 years, but feels like it's out of a parallel universe, as if it's a movie adaptation, but a movie adaptation that's extremely faithful to the source material. It was itself loosely adapted for X-Men 2. Claremont wanted to tell a story beyond the comic books, i.e. something more adult. There's a reason why God Loves was done as a graphic novel without the code seal. We did not want to restrict ourselves. Our feeling was, if you're going to do an adult story, it isn't a matter of nudity or cursing, it is a matter of concepts. It is a matter of dealing with visions of people and of social realities that might be considered inappropriate in a standard comic book, simply because the kids who read it might be too young and might draw the wrong impression from the story. Chris Claremont. The story was originally going to be drawn by Neil Adams. However, at the time, he was taking a principled stand on not doing work for hire. Basically, he took this assignment understanding that it wouldn't be work for hire, because he's since done work for hire, but he thought this one wouldn't be work for hire, and therefore, since it turned out it was work for hire, he decided not to do it. I'm sure that when the promise was made, it was a hopeful promise. One of those promises that turned out to be, I'm sure I can take care of it, but guess what? Those legal eagles got involved and said we can't do that because it'll set a dangerous legal precedent if we grant some freedom and equality to a freelance. It'll spread like an infection and we don't want that to happen. Neil Adams. I've met Neil Adams. We got into an argument. Our entire conversation was three minutes. Two and a half minutes of that was the argument. He's a prickly guy, but a really principled one, and actually, in a weird way, a nice one. Despite completing breathtaking pages and his desire to draw Wolverine, which he'd never got to do at that point, he had to walk because of principle. Adams had actually completed six pages at this point. The pages are gorgeous, but dramatically different than the art that the young, untested Brett Anderson created. Neil Adams is the better artist, but he may not have been right for this particular book. Anderson brought it to life. His art was more contemporary, less illustrated, less refined, sure, but somehow more real. Anderson was originally offered the opportunity to be the regular X-Men artist. However, he didn't feel he was good enough to do it. He did feel he could handle a graphic novel, however. Perfect. It's the X-Men. It's a one-shot. I get to take my time on it. Brett Anderson. And of course, if you haven't read it, spoilers. The story begins with the murder of two mutant children. Magneto then investigates the crime. Everything is tied to William Stryker, a hateful man hiding behind the good name of God and playing up the fears of his followers in their hatred of mutants. Stryker has a hit squad of purifiers who hunt and kill mutants. The book refers to them as muties and equates the use of that word to the use of the N-word. It is touchy and might actually be crossing the line, but the message is nonetheless powerful. After a televised debate with Stryker, Professor X is kidnapped thanks to the purifiers. Magneto and the X-Men must therefore team up to rescue him. Stryker then hooks Professor X up to a machine that will kill all mutants. The Magneto-led X-Men are able to stop Stryker at his rally. Though it's technically a cop who really does so. In the end, Professor X is quite troubled, as are all of the X-Men. Magneto offers that he and Charles should finally join sides. Professor X declines. Magneto leaves, feeling more justified in his own cause, thanks to the radical nature of Stryker and his remaining followers. The story is very of the moment, but also transcends time. It is essentially the story of a religious leader manipulating his followers in order to justify his own hate. In the 1980s, TV preachers were a big thing. A big thing. And later, a lot of them were discovered to have skeletons in their closet. Stryker is this guy in the movies. Not a faithful adaptation, but an excellent one, so I'll forgive that sin. Stryker uses religion to justify his own hate of mutants. To manipulate his followers into going as far as killing children, seen in the opening pages. And his own child before the events of the comic book. He is the definition of a cult leader. On the other side, Professor X, a leader who uses hope and ideas to motivate, not dread and fear. Of course, there's also Magneto. The third other side? 3D object? Maybe a cube? Magneto is confronted by his own methods and is conflicted. Yet reassured, extremism feeding extremism. Within the X-Men, there are various leaders who lead in very different ways. The previous mentioned Professor X and of course Magneto, his direct opposite. Can good guys be cult leaders as well? Or at least people with good intentions? Both Magneto and Professor X see themselves as doing good, doing right. And of course, Stryker does as well. But do they manipulate their own followers to do so? That's the question. What if others exploit their causes and their way of doing things to justify what they want? Their goal in the end. That's what X-Men God Love 
man kills, explores. The true depths of leadership, the dark side of it, and what it's really all about. So thank you guys for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what are your thoughts on X-Men God Loves and Man Kills. What are your thoughts on graphic novels and comic books? And where do you feel this fits into the X-Men continuity? Thank you guys so much. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Bye! Hi everybody, and welcome to Josiah is Right. As a kid, I was always fascinated by Iron Man, not because I loved the character, although I did love that suit, but because of his drinking problem. I saw that flaw and how it humanized him and made him very much a real person. Even if I couldn't relate to his character, I could relate to his flaw. However, as a kid, I had no real interest in that. I did, however, want to see an epic battle with the ultimate match for Iron Man, Doctor Doom. Doctor Doom always seemed the perfect villain for Iron Man, at least to me. However, there's one villain who's probably even more perfect, and his name has Iron in the title, so that tells you it's a more perfect villain. Iron Monger! Now as a kid, I never read this. So as a full grown man with a drinking problem of my own, I present to you the Iron Man Iron Monger Collection. This volume covers issues 193 through 200 of Iron Man. Spoilers ahead. Immediately we were faced with a problem. We're between two Iron Men. The story starts with Rhodey as Iron Man as Tony gave up his superheroing to get sober. It starts with a third rate West Coast Avengers avenging on the West Coast. Tony dons the old armor and helps Hawkeye, Mockingbird, and Tigress, a C-list of a B-list superhero team. Yes, sorry Jeremy Renner, but it's true. And I like the character, but it's true. They fight a dinosaur, which I assume is a robot operated by the mastermind here. The fight with a giant robotic dinosaur starts the itch. The itch for metal underpants! Or he just wants to be a superhero. Anyway, some random thug walks into I'm Not Ant-Man Anymore, Hank Pym's lab. Rhodey ends up in an alternate dimension where he comes out questioning who Iron Man really is. Rhodey is struggling with his identity as a superhero, which is a really cool concept and perhaps the best part of this collection. In issue 195, he visits with the aptly named Shaman. Rhodey's a hero and he knows he is, but he's not Iron Man. Who is he? Well, it'll be a few years before he figures that out, but for sure he is not Iron Man. That mantle belongs to somebody else. The visit with the Shaman gives us the only genuinely funny moments in this book. In some dreamscape, he strips naked, realizing Tony is Iron Man. Obadiah Stane, a man with a first name after my own heart, finally shows up. Up to this point, we really haven't had our true villain. And for the most part, he's sort of the puppet master type, which is fine, but less so when the story is called Iron Monger. In issue 196, with Iron Man suits that apparently have just been left around lying everywhere, in dreamscapes, Hi everybody and welcome to Josiah is Right. Today we're going to take a look at the Punisher Wolverine crossover story, The African Saga. Now to start with, the word saga is being a bit more than generous here. Star Wars, that is a saga my friends. In comics, the Dark Phoenix Saga is a saga. It's in the title, as it should be. This book is a compilation of two issues. Two issues does not a saga make. With Days of Future Past being a rare exception. The two issues in question here are Punisher War Journal number 6 and 7, both featuring Wolverine and clearly telling you that it's guest starring him. Then, as now, as forever shall it be, Wolverine sells comic books. The story is by Carl Potts, who also did the layouts along with a young pre-X-Men Jim Lee. Lee did the finished art as well. This is just before Lee's first guest issue on X-Men, Uncanny X-Men 248. Potts and Lee had collaborated earlier on Alpha Flight. Clearly also starring Wolverine. Like I said, he sells comic books. All of this is setting up Jim Lee becoming the regular artist on Uncanny X-Men shortly thereafter. Which he did for a little while. Until the mega-selling multi-cover X-Men number one. Before leaving shortly after that to form Image Comics. The art in this book is great. A more gritty, less Poe style of Jim Lee art. Which could be due to the earliness in his career or the gritty nature of the characters and the story here. Grit fits well. And this has grit. The story begins with the Punisher and his mechanic slash sidekick Micro. Frank is worn out. Micro suggests a vacation. Micro connects him. Really, he tricks him into taking work as a survival specialist for a rich, big game hunter from Texas. Meanwhile, in Madripoor, Wolverine is hunting a poacher. He then wears a cheetah pelt. Really because it looks cool, but he says he's taking it back to Africa. Returning it home, I guess. 
In Africa, we meet the Pygmy natives. This is the borderline, or maybe not so borderline, racist part, as they are clearly very primitive wearing these diaper things. Of course, they show their worth in the jungle. It turns out, the hunt is for a dinosaur. There's also a subplot about the hunter's wife having an affair with a poacher. That's really irrelevant, other than the fact that it sets up the fight between Punisher and Wolverine. Bad timing results in Logan thinking that Punisher is the poacher. Logan wins round one. Frank then goes on the hunt. There are more subplots that really don't get resolved here, so they feel kind of out of place and don't connect to this story. I'm sure they were setting up stories that go beyond in other Punisher War Journal comics, though. One such subplot, it's about a guy who's in Texas at the hunter dude's house, but he's a vision, or he's having a vision, I think? There are more dinosaurs. Big, boring dinos. In a Wolverine Punisher comic, you want them to fight a T-Rex. Had Jack Kirby drawn this comic book and these characters, you'd bet Devil Dinosaur would show up. The homewrecker and the poacher stupidly shout, they think the other guy's the bad guy, shoot. Of course, had they just shot, at least one of them would be dead. They leave the poacher, wrapped in the pelt, and the dinos come. And they walk on him. No awesome maulings, and we don't even get to see him get his bones crushed. Anyway, the jungle gets its justice, and the audience gets cheated. In the ultimate classy move, Big Pun shoots the hussy in the back. I know he's an anti-hero, but come on, that is technically your employer's wife. And again, the real cheat here is the audience. Hey! In the lack of a truly great, we misunderstood each other, Marvel superhero team up and fight the real bad guys, final battle kind of thing. As a kid, this was a beloved story for me. I even had trading cards of it, including Punisher fighting that alligator. I realized there are some awesome splash panels here, but to get these two characters together, it really deserves a better story, a more dynamic story, really, the plot you have here, extended out, would work really well to that effect. Just give it more time to grow, be a more natural thing, not just suddenly Wolverines in Africa, suddenly Punishers in Africa. Bring them there, draw them out, draw them together through the story. It could really work well. And again, two issues usually is enough to make a saga. In short, this book cost me a dollar, maybe two dollars, and it's a fun read if you like those characters. If not, it's probably not worth your time. If you liked, please hit like. Also, leave a comment. Who would win, Punisher or Wolverine? In this book, unfortunately, they didn't get to truly fight, so we don't know. We may never know, but you can tell us. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't, and thank you, and remember, Josiah is right, even about superhero fights. When one of them isn't technically a superhero, and he's just a guy with a lot of guns.